From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. The world is shifting focus again now toward opening up this time, several months after much shutting down. But as we do, I, for one, hope we won't turn too quickly away from awareness of the solace that the garden has provided and that it offers for us at all times, bad or good. Today's guest has been taking note of that in various ways in his columns for the Washington Post throughout this strangest and most chaotic of springs, exploring the garden as an anchor, a support. In his longtime role as gardening columnist there, Adrian Higgins always inspires readers to connect. More from him in a moment, but first, these messages. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. Brushwoodnursery.com. Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. I'm so pleased to welcome Washington Post gardening columnist Adrian Higgins to the program today. His thoughtful work has inspired me for years. He delves beyond just horticulture and great plants, though always serving up plenty of both regularly exploring stewardship of the environment and even matters of the spirit. So welcome, Adrian. How are you? Hello, Margaret. I'm fine. Thank you very much for inviting me on. Yes, it's way overdue. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It is. So the Washington Post was ready, was at the ready, um, when everyone got sequestered at home, staring out the window at their yards, wondering what to do, because you've been there all these years with your loyal following. Um, But what an assignment, a little bit different from a normal spring of garden writing. Yeah, absolutely. But, um, you know, I I was sort of worried as a journalist about what can I write about gardening and the pandemic? And I actually didn't even have to think about it because the garden is there for a pandemic. It's there for when you have to isolate. I, I, I didn't fully understand quite how nourishing uh you know the garden could be and it was just uh, it was just a, a, a sort of a situation where i had to to uh state the obvious i mean which is that you know <laughs> gardens are just so healing and nourishing to people yeah you you emailed uh, in an exchange an email we had the other day you mentioned that the great gardener and garden author david culp had a sharp insight to that effect Do you want to share that with everybody else what he said about yeah. it Yes, David has a new book out uh, called uh, A Year at Brandywine Cottage, and, and I'm sure your your audience would love to hear directly from him. But um, he sort of shares in the book and with me that there were moments in his life where he had to uh, recuperate from some serious illnesses. And the impulse for a, a passionate gardener as we know, is to keep, uh, to, to, for us to be the nurse of the garden, for us to keep mm-hmm. looking after it and caring for it. And he said what he, what he had to sort of consciously do when he was recuperating in the garden was to allow the garden to give him some healing back, and it was ready, willing, and able to do so. So mm-hmm. I think that in itself is an incredible lesson for all of us that we have to you know sometimes we just have to stop fretting about the weeds or the the wilted leaves or whatever the lack of mulch and and just sort of let the garden you know come back to us it's funny when you just said that it reminded me of many years ago um Marco Stufano from Wave Hill who founded Wave Hill you know started the gardens at Wave Hill in New York um I was moaning around this time of year when spring starts to turn to summer and everything looks like hell and there's a lot of weeds and cutbacks to be done. And I was like, oh, it's horrible. My place looks horrible. And I I just can't get I can't get off the hook. You know, I'm just on the hook all the time with it. And I was moaning and moaning. And he said, Margaret, you created the hook. Just (laughs) exhale. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it made me think of what you just said. 
But you're yeah, right, it can exactly. help us. We don't just have to be the nursemaid, as you just explained. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it requires a mental shift because when you are a, a, a passionate gardener, you see it as a process, as something that you're constantly doing. And we don't sort of just sit down and stop and sort of see objectively the um, what we've created. We, we can't see what we've created. We're so right. close to it. Right. So before we get to more of the sort of soulful part, I wanted to... You've been, of course, covering what's going on, the impact this has had on the industry, on nurseries, seed companies, public gardens. And the pandemic shutdowns happened just as the garden season was kind of rolling up, beginning to really roll up the country from south to north. You know, nurseries and public spaces were going into the beginnings of high gear. I read this uh, sentence or two the other day in um, Grower Talks, the trade publication. Chris mm-hmm. Beatty's, the editor, wrote this. He said, this assessment, he said, this season was a crazy, roaring, raging, once-in-a-lifetime anomaly. The pandemic destroyed the horticulture business in April and sent it soaring to record highs in May. <laughs> and I sort of thought, mm-hmm. what's your take on how it affected the business, Adrian? Well, I know, as you know, that, that with seed companies, they, they went through, you know, they, they were completely overwhelmed with demand. Uh, we can talk about that. But uh, I, I hadn't heard that. And I'm glad to hear, actually, that there was a rebounding because, as you know, the, the, the spring season from March to, you know, now is, is the key time for retail uh, nurseries and, and garden centers, and it's it's you know it's their make or break period. So the the idea of everyone being in quarantine in sort of late March into April must have been just horrific for for these business people. Um, so I'm glad that it has bounded back. Um, mm-hmm. a, a lot of nurseries have um, you know offered sort of curbside pickup or social yes. distancing. Most of them remained open during during the pandemic, um, but obviously in very constrained circumstances. So I'm glad yeah. to, to hear that. I haven't heard. Yes, that. every week he takes a pulse. You know, he asks for everyone to send in from one to ten uh, an assessment of the week, so to speak, all over the country and Canada, and then he publishes it in each edition of his newsletter each week. And um, and so yes, it came roaring back now. That doesn't mean there wasn't much suffering and that many um, perishables were not tossed in the compost heap, you know, right? I mean, the, the yeah. early sale stuff, probably some of it went by and no one bought it. So Yeah, all those bedding annuals and spring yeah. annuals and herbs and things, I'm sure they were just written off, unfortunately. Yeah. In certain areas, I would imagine, yes, if places yeah. were closed. And as you said, the seed companies, some of them like um, – Tom Stearns at High Mowing um, in Vermont, he said some weeks they were up as much as 300% year over year, you know, from mid-March onward. And then they had to, as many places that they had to take a hiatus because they couldn't, they had to pack more seeds. I mean, they had to put more seeds in packets, you know. It was just too yeah. much. So Yeah, no, I was talking to seed companies at the oh, height of this. And, I'm sorry. And they were, um, you know, they had to, as you say, literally shut down. So that they could catch up with the orders, and recognizing too that they were their own staffing was diminished uh, right. for the for their own safety, and a lot of uh, vegetables like beans and lettuce and uh, well, lots of different things they they just they sold out quickly. Yeah. So. Um, uh, and you know, fortunately. Uh, certainly in many parts of the country, especially in the mid-Atlantic, you, to me, I've always said that the autumn garden, vegetable garden, is perhaps the best season of the year. So we still have lots and lots of time to to get more seed and, and, and have a successful growing year. Yes. Um, the public gardens, as you said in a recent column, and this has been one of the real heartbreaking things for me to watch because I, 
you know, as you have over the years interviewed so many people at them, visited so many of them, spoken at them, whatever, and, you know, have a tenderness for them. Um, you wrote in a recent column of at least 600 public gardens across the U.S., large and small, all but a handful have been closed since mid-March. And it's sort of, now what? How do they reopen? How do they prepare to reopen? So what about some of that, your thoughts about some of that? Well, some of them are preparing to reopen, and yeah. but it will be in a diminished uh, way. I mean, the Denver Botanical Gardens recently reopened, but it's on a on a time ticket. I seem to be going to like a time ticket. So yeah. they so they meter the number of people who enter. And um, so I don't know, it, may, it might be, it's probably only 25% of their capacity. Right. Um, so if you get a ticket, it's great because you've got the place to yourself. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but obviously, you know, they're doing the best they can and trying to be safe about it. So things are opening up a little bit. Yeah, the problem being that the money in a big public garden, especially you just mentioned Denver or New York Botanical Garden, a place that has shows, an orchid show, the the whatever show, you know, a seasonal shows that go on for a couple of few, few months and a premium ticket purchase, that's a big part of their income. That's what keeps the lights on. And making those happen um, in a tighter space, you know, than the time tickets for the outdoor use of the grounds that you were just speaking of, much harder to figure out. It's almost like reopening Broadway shows. Do you, do you know what I mean? Much harder thing than letting people walk on Broadway again, <laughs> you know, down the street. Um, yeah. Tricky. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, I think that uh, the, the public gardens are no, not that much different from other cultural institutions in that they rely on ticket sales, you know, heavily to to for their operations, and and there's no question they've taken a huge hit now. Yeah, yeah. So the soul, I, you know, I feel mm. like I should have like music, and I should cue up my favorite saxophone player ever, um, Coleman Hawkins, performing his. Uh, I think it was 1939. It was very radical at the time. This rendition of the song "Body and Soul," because the garden, and you've written this recently, does sustain both body and soul, doesn't it? It does. Um, I, I think perhaps I'm stating the obvious, but uh, in terms of the body, we talk about the vegetable gardens and how everyone has uh, has suddenly, you know, wants a victory garden. And you see it, and you can walk through any neighborhood and, and see um, makeshift new growing beds, I think. Um, and so people are obviously perhaps earlier in the pandemic when we didn't know about the food supply, uh, people were going out and, you know, scrambling to buy beans. And uh, I got a load of seed potatoes. Um, I went to this sort of feed store way out in the country uh, as I got wind of the the lockdown and uh, got, I think, you know, 12 pounds of seed potatoes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which <laughs> which are now growing fabulously. They're really happy. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, to getting those in a month or so. You said beans, and I think you wrote... Didn't you write a column that was something like beans, the pandemic vegetable or something? Yeah, I did. I, I, I thought <laughs> beans were just um, fabulous on it for, for a number of reasons. One, you know, the seeds are really big, so kids can plant them. Um they sprout quickly once the soil has warmed. Um, they don't get too many pests and diseases. Um, they're, they're, they're harvestable quite quickly. And then you can also let them go to seed for y- your own seed source. So they have everything going for them, really. Yeah. Um, I, I've, yeah. Always, I've always joked, you know, the, the nursery, the fairy tale about Jack and the Beanstalk, and he sold this cow for five beans. Well, I'd much rather have the five beans than the cow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because they're self-perpetuating from five exactly. beans. You can have beans for the rest of your lifetime, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and I love dry beans, so, of course, even if they go too far in the pods, like... 
my scarlet runner beans and so forth. You know, you can always cook them up afterward because they're delicious. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Unless they're um, so pretty. They're beautiful. They're beautiful. Yeah. 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 And um, a lot of the, um, like with some of them, the hummingbirds love the flowers. And you know what I mean? It's just, they're just, they make me happy. Uh, it's one of my favorite yeah. things to grow. So I was glad when I saw that headline that made me smile. <laughs> Yes, um, thank you. And, yeah. well, and, and and shifting to sort of the soulful aspect, um, my own feeling is um, that this moment with your garden and in isolation, uh, you know, if you tune out all the leaf blowers, uh, it, it sort of instills in you, I think, the value of this quiet moment and um, quite how rare and... Uh, extraordinary it is um it sort of forces a certain sense of stillness upon you and that's what you need to sort of be able to fully take in perceive your plants and your garden and you know to sort of fully realize the richness that, that it that it gives to our lives yeah um you kind of in in another recent column you kind of I'm going to say free associated. I don't know how you thought of the idea, but from what you just said, quiet moments, you kind of free associated and wrote about a garden that's set in kind of a monastery setting. Um, a place that the headline was in medieval monastery gardens, an uplifting model for something we could all use, refuge. So tell us a little bit about that assignment. Well, it, it um it, if you study landscape history, as I'm sure you have, um, there, there was a plan, a sort of a model plan of a monastery garden that was discovered in, a, in an abbey library in Switzerland called St. Gaul. And uh, in it was sort of the um, Charlemagne's blueprint for, a, for a, a, a monastery garden. And that actually became sort of the prototype for all our sort of four square gardens that, that sort of uh, uh, fl flowed from that, not just the monasteries of the Middle Ages, but the sort of more formal gardens of the Renaissance and uh, the French uh, 18th, 17th centuries, and then sort of our own sort of formal gardens. So it's an extremely important document that, that preserved something that otherwise might have been lost. And it occurred to me that these monks were keeping uh, this garden alive against sort of a, a world that was forcing them to uh, uh, self-quarantine, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and the, the I think what, what, it, what must it be like to have been a monk in a garden back then? And, <laughs> of course, your New York uh, listeners will know that the cloisters in, in um, northern Manhattan there are, are exactly that. They're, they're replications or embellished replications of these ancient monastic gardens. And uh, so I was talking to the gardener there who, for the past few weeks has been, you know, in there alone eight hours a day, just toiling with these beautiful plants and uh, trying to get a sense of how he feels about that and, and the idea that it's, it's sort of going back to their origins of, of these monks, basically in isolation, gardening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved it. That I, 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 it didn't occur to me, and when I saw that, I thought, oh, "Of course, of course, that's exactly." And we each have those of us. Uh, I mean, I'm in a rural place, so for me, it's quiet, and there's a lot of solitude, you know, distant from other people, and and so I, oh, it just it just spoke to me. That one really spoke to me. Um, yeah, yeah. Good. I mean, so, the other aspect I think is. Um, we, we, we think, uh, and we're programmed, obviously, to think that the world revolves around us. <laughs> it, if not us individually, then the human species. Yeah. But we're just one part of nature. Um, 
And I, I think a lot of our missteps with nature have stemmed from the fact that we've forgotten that. We, we've yeah. forgotten that we are one animal on this planet. And um, this stillness, this now moment in the garden, I think gives us an opportunity to, to, to make that connection again. And uh, the point I make is, sadly, this virus is is using our bodies, you know, as a way to propagate. Mm. So, and, you know, the, you know, we're so smart and we, we, we know everything, and, but here we are. We're all stuck at home because we don't want to be preyed upon by this, mm. this thing, which I, I, I think does actually bring home the fact that we are a, a part of nature and we, we can't sort of think that we're not. You know, to our, you know, detriment if we do. Yeah. So in the last few minutes, I wanted to talk about how, what have you been gardening this year, and and what have you been, what have sort of your personal adventures. Um, uh, and I want to remind people. I mean, I'll give links to all the columns I've been referring to, so people can read them for themselves. Um, and you also sometimes do chats. I think the Washington Post to do live chats and so forth. So there's lots for them to dig into. But what have you been doing in your own gardening adventures? Because I assume you haven't been going out to visit places as much. No, I, ha- I haven't really been visiting at all. Um, mm-hmm. From my, my work perspective, I've been doing everything basically on the phone. Mm. Um, uh, thankfully, I'm able to do that. I think I've, I, I have enough perspective and knowledge to be able to make that work. But from a personal standpoint, I do very much miss going to see gardens. Yeah. And I have felt that loss, you know. Um, I do have a, a fairly elaborate uh, community garden that, um, that has kept me busy. Um, this year I'm doing something. I had a beautiful old rose bower on one fence. It, it's fence, this thing. And um, anyway, it kept... It was in decline, and I finally took it down. But I wanted to sort of return some sense of screening. So this year, I've, I've picked a very tall, dent corn. It grows to about nine feet. Oh. And I've planted a whole row, two rows of it against this side of the garden. And my plan is to create this hedge of corn. So huh. we'll see if that works. I know people do that also with, uh, I think, sorghum, yeah? I mean, the, among the taller yes. kind of grain-like crops, yeah? Yeah, the sorghum doesn't get as high, but Not I'm, as I'm, high, I'm yeah. counting on this corn getting, you know, as they say in the song, as high as an elephant's eye. So I know. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be hiding behind the corn. And I'm also planning to grow some beans up one row of them, as the way the Native Americans did. When you have your 15 pounds of seed potatoes in the ground, and so the beans will be good with that, I think. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be uh, well plumped up by September. <laughs> no, no ornamental endeavors this, this year, mostly food? You're a victory garden guy this year? Yeah, I'm, I'm also growing... Um, some tomatoes. I've actually um, cooled to tomatoes in recent years because in the mid-Atlantic, the summers seem to be getting hotter. Yeah. And they actually don't like it when it's so hot. And um, this get sort of ragged and diseased. And however careful you are with them, and uh, I wouldn't want to spray any. So... I've sort of moved away from tomatoes in recent years. Hmm. Well, Adrian Higgins, kindred spirit. <laughs> um, I'm glad <laughs> to always hear your voice and um, and read your voice. And so I appreciate what you've been writing about being out there on your phone on the beat this year um, during this very strangest of springs. I'm really glad to have you on the program, and I hope we'll talk again soon. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much, Margaret. I really enjoyed it. Thank you.
Programming and underwriting support from Garden Tool Company. Garden Tool Company's wide selection of heirloom quality, quality tools for your gardening passion is backed by outstanding customer service, fast shipping, and ongoing support. GardenToolCompany.com. Programming and underwriting support from Brushwood Nursery. For more than 20 years, Brushwood Nursery has shipped the finest selection of clematis and other vines all over the United States with full gallon-sized plant and free shipping. Their website is full of beautiful pictures and information on growing clematis. BrushwoodNursery.com. And I hope to talk to all the rest of you again soon. Now, don't miss an episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or iTunes or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com or on Facebook or Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio. Mm-hmm.